It's postseason time here on Bills by the Numbers. Glad you punched your ticket to be with us. We're presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Just ahead, is this the best Bills defense heading into the playoffs in the McDermott era and why? We talk Steelers with former Bills and Steelers linebacker Arthur Motes. And we have our one burning question. Is there a way to block Steelers fans at the state line this weekend? Happy to have you with us here on Bills by the Numbers, where we let the stats tell you where the Bills are at. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker, Bills Insider Chris Brown with you, and we begin with a state of the Bills discussion entering the playoffs. We've seen the Bills grind out victories on their current five-game winning streak. The only opponent from which they've been able to pull away is Dallas when they ran for 266 yards. The rest of the games during that stretch have been nip and tuck with the other four being won by seven, six, three, and two points. The defense has had to finish three of those games on that five-game winning streak at Kansas City, at the Chargers, and at Miami last week. The offense, as we know, was able to run out the clock against New England. So, as the Bills enter the playoffs, is Buffalo's defense the best in the McDermott era entering this postseason? Uh, statistically, I don't know if it's the best, but it, I, I'll say this. It's the one I like the most because they make plays. Yeah. You know, when, they, when you need something to happen, they, they go make it happen. They turnovers, sacks, fumbles. Um, they just do the things it takes to win in the moment it's there. And that's different than what we've seen. This has been a defense that has kind of waited on the other team to mistake it away. And the Bills, this defense, even though statistically sometimes they get nicked, like giving up explosive plays once in a while, man, oh, man, they come up with some turnovers and they get a sack here and there and they rush the passer and they do these things consistently. Um, so, I, yeah, while it's statistically not the best, I think it's the one I have maybe the most confidence in. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. We remember the 2021 Bills defense was number one in the league in total defense they were also number one in a host of other categories and they were either first or second in points allowed this team is fourth in points allowed and they're up near the top in a lot of categories they finished third in the league in sacks tied for second in sacks in franchise history with 54 um and you're right the splash plays have been there and that is what sean mcdermott wanted to infuse into this defense as he took over the play calling duties and the results are obvious and you're right you look at some of those games down the stretch on the winning streak in the sprint to the division title and they end the Kansas City game with a tip pass by Ed Oliver on third down and then they get a fourth down in completion they win the game by three you go to the Chargers game Ed Oliver with a sack at the end helps them run the clock down so the Chargers can't come back and kick a game winning field goal And then last week against the Dolphins, the Taylor Rapp interception after the Bills couldn't hold on to the football and kill the clock at the end. So, yes, splash plays have been the biggest difference. And those are the kinds of plays that win playoff games, too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think the the part about it is we've been talking about this since the Leslie Frazier decision was made in the offseason, that maybe this team might not be as – as staunch statistically but the splash plays would come back and it's exactly the way it's happened and um that's one of the predictions we made about this season that we got right actually uh it really has turned out that this defense while still being strong top five and points allowed they get splash splash plays and there have been instances at the end of games where in past you can think of times where they were they played passive and just waited for the other team to run out of opportunities this defense forces the issue, and a lot of teams that we've seen, like these last four or five games, teams just aren't up to making the plays it takes to win against them, and that's, that's a big difference. Yeah, as we mentioned, we know this is the first season that head coach Sean McDermott is calling the defense, and one thing he does is change the picture a lot for opposing offenses. He's also had to change things due to injuries and personnel changes. No Matt Milano or Tredavious White, for example, but the white void 
has been filled by Rasul Douglas. They found a way around the Milano absence, mixing and matching personnel and scheme. What is it you believe this defense does best? Maybe it is the splash plays, but in light of the absences that they had to sustain, what do you think they do best? I got to be honest with you. I think one of the things they do best is adjust after the game begins. Okay. Uh, they their sec their halftime adjustments, their in game adjustments have been spot on, and the players have seemed to be uh, you know rally to it. Uh, they've also freed these guys up. I think they're for for whatever reason. I think they're coaching these guys like they trust them a little bit more, and for that the players feel confident to jump a route. I mean, Rasul Douglas uh, in the in the interceptions he made against the in, the uh, New England Patriots, he was totally con- you have to be totally confident doing that. Now, certainly one was a miscommunication, but the others, I mean, the guy was on it. Um, I think that attitude has been as big a difference um, in this scheme as we've seen. Uh, I think that's made the biggest difference. Um, What they do best, though, I still think their front four, front five, front six are the engine that runs not just the defense, but the entire team the confidence they have in their ability to stop the run with the guys they've got, their ability to overlook. You know, when when Jordan Phillips went out, Linval Joseph comes in, uh, Ed Oliver has played elite at defensive tackle. Um, ben, uh, Benford has been an, an enormous, I think, pleasant surprise. Uh, so has A.J. Epinesa playing his best football, Greg Rousseau, um, and, of course, Leonard Floyd, who has just been a monster. So I think those guys are still – the engine that runs not just the defense but the whole team. Yeah, you kind of stole my answer. For me, it's the defensive front. Um, as we mentioned, finished tied for third in the league in sacks with 54 and uh, really have just been the, I guess, headline of this right. defense. I mean, look, right. they take the ball away very, very well. I think they finished fourth in team history in takeaways with 31. Um, so that should not be dismissed at all, but the guys up front really set the tone for this defense, and I think they've done that all season. Even in the long-term absence of Daquan Jones, they capably plugged that hole as well and really didn't miss a beat up front. If there is a problem area for this defense, it has been on third down and getting off the field. 19th in the league in third down defense, and it wasn't much better during their five-game winning streak as they ranked 18th in that category over that stretch. Where they've made up for it, to our point earlier, is with interceptions. Second in the league in picks on their five-game winning streak to finish the season with seven. But as we know, Steve, once you get to the playoffs, you're playing some of the best quarterbacks in the game, maybe not this week against the Steelers, but it's hard to rely on takeaways to be the answer for you. So what part of Buffalo's defense needs to improve to ensure consistent success on that side of the ball in the postseason. Well, it's hard to look past this game that they've got this week because the whole pre-postseason is focused on this, the next game. Uh, the Steelers run it really well. They, Najee Harris is an enorm, is a big back. They're going to bo- they're have to bear up in the run game. They've got to be more successful on first and second down if they're going to be more successful on third down. It's just that simple. First and second down, I think, is the key in this game when you're defending the Steelers. You've got to keep them in third and long. Uh, you can't let them plow ahead for four and a half and then four and a half and then have a third and one. Um, you just can't. So I think that's going to be the key um, in this game, in this postseason. Run defense has to step up. In a game like the weather's going to be here in Buffalo, and if all goes, if all your hopes and dreams come true, you're going to have two games in Buffalo, and neither one of them is going to be 70 and sunny. So you've got to be good on the ground, and you've got to have an answer on first and second down runs. Yeah. For me, this is a Linval Joseph game. Yeah. Get your biggest, widest, stoutest run defender on the field and put them in long down and distance situations, whether it's second and 12, third and eight, whatever the case might be, force this Steelers offense to play to your strengths, which, as we just said earlier, is getting after the passer, creating havoc, in those long down and distance situations, which thereby force takeaway opportunities. Fortunately for the Bills, they're playing a quarterback in Mason Rudolph who serves as more of a complement to the Steelers' run game, so perhaps that will let Buffalo focus on stopping the run first and foremost on Sunday. For more on this wild card matchup, 
we welcome in our good friend, former Bills and Steelers linebacker Arthur Motes, who hosts the Arthur Motes Experience and does Steelers pregame and postgame work for more details on this Steelers squad. All right, Arthur, let's start here concerning the Steelers. We know that through the course of the season, they're a middle-of-the-road blitz team, about 30% blitz, and they play a good deal of man coverage, which surprised me a little bit, a lot of single safety high. How much does that change with T.J. Watt out of the mix defensively? Yeah, I mean, first off, a lot of that changes. Um, T.J. Watt is the big reason why you don't have to blitz as much. When you got a guy that could just win one-on-ones, him, Alex Highsmith, I mean, that was the recipe, right? And then on the back end, earlier on in the season, they were a lot more healthy. Whereas now at this stage, they have actually transitioned to playing more of a zone concept when they were missing Minka Fitzpatrick and Demonte Casey. Now, both of those guys should potentially be back this weekend, but that was a big factor into why they were playing what they were playing. But now they have shifted to, like I said, a lot more of this cover three concept and they'll do more of the pressure uh, in terms of blitzing just to make up for a loss of a T.J. Watt. What does Minka Fitzpatrick and his presence in or out, how's that change things in the back end? Oh, man, it's a massive, uh, massive impact. No different than when we're talking Jordan Poyer or Micah Hyde, right? We know how they can you know, patrol the back end and at times just keep everybody calm. That's the Minka Fitzpatrick effect. You know, obviously he's a high-end talent who can create splash plays by himself, but more importantly than anything, he's the person that calms it all. And whenever something goes wrong, he's the guy that can kind of make it right and kind of get you out of that down. So, you know, when he's out there, that's a huge element. But when he's been gone, they've also felt that as well. I know Coach Tomlin mentioned this this week that they have had problems covering tight ends in the passing game, second-level stuff, that kind of thing. Um, who has been the main target of opponents in that area? Man, so when you think about some of the injuries that the uh, Steelers have sustained over just the past couple of weeks, I mean, obviously in Buffalo, we could talk, you know, Matt Milano going down, and that was massive. But over in Pittsburgh, they went through a Cole Holcomb. They went through a Quan Alexander. Um, they've had a Landon Roberts kind of in and out of it. So when you get down to your fourth, fifth, I mean, dudes that you're literally signing on Monday and they're starting, you know, come Sunday, those were the guys that really were the focal point for offenses to go after. And let's be real, if you're Buffalo, between Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox, that's absolutely where you want to attack because you know that they're still going to have some deficiencies there just because of the personnel that they're dealing with right now. When Mason Rudolph came in three or four games ago, did you could you notice something significant change? What tangibly changed? I mean, it's got to be more than just a vibe of a different voice calling the plays. What did Mason Rudolph bring to the table that made things made it possible for these guys to go on this run? Yeah, trust me, man. A lot of people in Pittsburgh were completely shocked by his success and, you know, the sustainable uh, element of it as well. Because prior to that, the only, you know, long term example that we had was from when he first got a chance to start. And he obviously was benched at a point in that season for Doug Hodges. So the big thing that I think this year is just that he's playing with a lot more confidence. He looks like a guy who has failed before and while he was, you know, working his way back. He actually was working on developing certain skills. I think his footwork is a lot more consistent. I think in terms of just some processing information when he's looking at different coverages, zone versus man, I think that he's just a lot more confident when he's doing that. And that's a big reason why he's able to play the way that he is. But you also have to factor in the running game. Since he's taken over, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren on the ground have been a lot more dynamic, a lot more productive. And the same way we look at James Cook and we're seeing how that has really helped out Josh this season, that's the same concept for Mason Rudolph right now. And those running backs have really taken a lot of pressure off of him. And as much as uh, we understand that Najee Harris is kind of the, the battering ram, Jalen Warren has impressed. I mean, this guy's got some explosive power to his game and he can take a short pass and go a long way due to that explosion and breakaway speed what what has to me he's the guy you got to worry about the most because he's a big play waiting to happen out of the backfield is he not no without a doubt I mean when you're talking Jalen Warren he's the explosive guy like you said we always say Najee Harris the body puncher he's the guy that's going to jab jab beat you up beat you up have you you know 
thinking it's one way, one way. And then when 30 comes out there, Jalen Warren, that's the guy that takes that five yard run 60 yards. That's the guy that takes that screen pass 50 yards. The guy that can make a guy miss and really put your defense, um, just strain them, you know? And the thing that has been really unique is the dynamic of how both of those guys have come to the team. One being a first round draft pick, the other being an undrafted free agent, but their ability to just work together, right? Not having any personal emotions, have any type of negative impact on their play. That's the beautiful part. But yeah, Jalen Warren has done a phenomenal job and has really been a breath of fresh air for that Steelers offense. Last one from me, Arthur. How do you see these teams, the Steelers offense and defense strengths and weaknesses and the Bills strengths and weaknesses? How do you see this game fitting together and coming out? Yeah, man. So I see this going a couple of ways. Um, obviously, when you're talking Pittsburgh, since Mason has taken over, the running game has been a big part of it. The play action pass shot play that we've seen, whether it's to Deontay Johnson or George Pickens. And then defensively, it's all about creating the turnovers. They live with the turnovers and that's how they get after it. But when you talk to Buffalo, we know you can either do the slow game where we're going to play through James Cook and beat you that way, him on the ground and him catching out the backfield. Or is Josh taking over and being Josh? But we do also know with Josh, you got to just make sure that you survive the early portion where you might have that occasional turnover or two. But once that is out of his system, that's where Josh just goes crazy. So for me, I'm excited to see how this game plays out. I do think it's going to be a close game, more so with the weather. I think that that's going to have a little bit more of an impact on it. But either way, I definitely think this should be a good one. And I'm going to be excited regardless. <laughs> Fair enough, Arthur. Thanks for the time. We'll catch up with you down the line. No, I appreciate you guys as well. Hey, Bills fans, get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Just download the app today to play any way you want. Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. Best of all, you get paid your winnings fast. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports book partner of the Buffalo Bills. We move ahead to the numbers game, where Steve will be challenged with oh Bills, gosh. Steelers, Trivia. Let's see how he does. Question number one. How many total times, this is a layup, Steve. How many total times have the Bills and Steelers met in the playoffs? Uh, one, two. It is three. The answer is three. They met in 1974. You were in the other two. Yes. Uh, so, question number two. In that 1974 matchup, between the Bills and Steelers in the divisional playoff in Pittsburgh, which player had more rushing yards? O.J. Simpson or Franco Harris? Wow, how about, th- how about those names? Wow. Two Hall of Famers. Uh, I'll say O.J. And that would be incorrect. You had a 50-50 shot at it. Franco, for two. Neither, neither did very well. Franco, 24 carries for 74 yards, a 3.1 average. That's a rough day. Simpson... 15 carries, 49 yards, a 3.9 average. Franco was a little bit more instrumental in the victory. He had three rushing touchdowns. Question number three. In the 1992 matchup between the Bills and Steelers in the divisional playoff, again in Pittsburgh, Buffalo won 24-3. There was only one player for Buffalo who had more than 100 yards from scrimmage. Who was it? James Lofton. It was not James God. Lofton. I'll give you one more crack at it. Andre. Incorrect. It was Kenny Davis. Ten carries, Man. 104 yards. How about that? I'm, I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question four. In the 1996 divisional playoff against the Steelers, so this is 95 season, January 96. Right. There was someone else besides Jim Kelly who threw a touchdown pass for the Bills. Um, who was it? Alex Van Pelt. There you go. Offensive he had to come court, in for an injured Jim. Offensive the Cleveland Browns this year. That's right. Had to come in for an injured Jim Kelly, although Jim did come back in the game. Alex finishes 4 for 10 for 27 yards. Um, so, yeah, he threw a touchdown pass in his native Pittsburgh. Yeah. Very much Bonus so. question, Steve. All right. How many questions? How many catch? Four. Yeah, this is. Question five, bonus question. How many catches did Steve Tasker have in that 96 playoff game? I had a couple. One of them was called back on a holding call. I had one that was down to the one. 
I had a bunch of handoffs and stuff like that. Total receptions know, in the game I'm for Steve one. Tasker. I'm just say one. It was two for 38 See, yards. I, you can't even remember your own stats. Know, Come on! I, was were the forward I'm trying hand, to help you were here? Were the forward handoffs counted as passes or? Well, I guess if if Jim taught you know how they no, do he it just now. Handed it to him. And Alex did it. I, I'm just did. going by what the box score told me, All Steve. Right. Two catches that's for fine. 38 yards. No, Give that's yourself fine. a little more credit, that's will you? Fine. I doubled one. my catch. Catch. That's right. I was one of five on games I was actually in. Yeah, I think you were today. also one for five in the numbers. That's game. what I mean. I was one for five in the in the numbers game in the games I was actually playing in. I thought I was helping you. But who knew? Uh, time now for our one burning question, Steve. Who is priority number one for the Bills in this matchup with Pittsburgh? Oh, I think it's uh, Jalen Warren. I think he's the guy. I think so, too. Uh, his speed and his ability to make a big play, snap off a big play. I think Najee Harris is a guy, big running back. Uh, both those guys are going to be you know, good, but I think Najee, I mean, Jalen Warren is the dangerous one. You don't want to give us an explosive play to a quarterback like Mason Rudolph. you got to make them go the long way, see if they yeah. can do it. And do not give Warren any opportunity in space. Let's not forget, right. all the way back in the preseason game in Pittsburgh in August, he busted off one for 50, 60 yards yeah. for a touchdown. That's the and, that thing. Was... And, th and think about it, The Bills struggled with that early in the Miami game. They were, they were getting strung out to the sideline and they, you know, giving the guy some space. Uh, and A-Chan nicked him a few for yep. a few big runs. So they've got to get that shored up. And, um, you know, and I, I say that on the offensive side. On the other side, Highsmith, I think, is the guy. Right, and fortunately, without Watt, they can focus more attention there. Yeah. But I would agree with you. I think it is Warren. Got to take care of that guy, keep him under wraps, and they should be good to go. Our closing figure deals with the matchup with the Pittsburgh Steelers. We know the Bills have been in their fair share of one-score games this season. Twelve, in fact. And Buffalo has gone six and six in those games, although they are on a four-game winning streak in one-score affairs currently. The Steelers have been in 11 one-score games. They are nine and two in one-score affairs. In fact, Pittsburgh led the league this season in one-score victories with nine. Buffalo tied for fourth with six. That's all for us on this episode. Make sure you subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use so you know when our next episode is released. Because when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time, everybody. 